Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. This morning, our call to worship is from Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I would like to invite our new council members forward uh, for our installation. And as we do so, I'd like to give a special thanks to Ken Kaler. Looks like he's probably traveling the world this week. I don't see him. But if uh, Cameron and Mary Jo and Ron and Rita and Alan would all come forward, we don't want Alan to have to stand up here by himself. Yeah. Okay. That's not going to work. Dear friends in Christ, you have been elected by this congregation to serve as officers in accordance with its constitution. Hear the word of God concerning the office to which you have been called. From the book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 2 to 4. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Hear also concerning the duties of the office to which you have been called. As council members, it shall be your duty to assist the pastor and counsel him in all his work for the building up of the congregation, to help him in ministering to the sick as well as to the poor and distressed, and in the cultivation of peace, goodwill, and love among the members. You are also to assist him in making suitable provision for the instruction of the young, in the maintenance of church order, in the admonishing of the erring, and the exercise of church discipline in accordance with your constitution and the word of God. In the absence of the pastor, or if the congregation should be without a pastor, you are to see that the worship series are held at the appointed times and are conducted properly in order. That the pure gospel and pre- that the pure gospel be preached according to the faith of the church, the sacraments rightly administered, and that only those who are approved by the constitution be allowed to preach. As trustees, you are to see that the property of the congregation is cared for and that all of its temporal affairs are properly administered. Together, you are to set a good example as servants of Christ and as officers in his congregation. The congregation and pastor need your leadership in prayer, encouragement, and service in order that the congregation may know that you are willing to take upon yourselves these duties, I ask you. Do you accept the office and duties set before you, and do you promise to discharge these duties faithfully in the fear of God in accordance with the Constitution, principles, and usage of our congregation? If so, answer, yes, by the help of God. Yes, by the help of God. The triune God who has called you to serve of his congregation, enlighten and strengthen you in your office, that you may prove to be good and faithful stewards to the praise of his holy name. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have established within your congregation the ministry of the Word and have supported that good work with a variety of spiritual gifts. We thank you that you have provided people of good reputation, ready to serve this congregation for your sake. We humbly pray that you would bless them with the, with, with the presence of your Holy Spirit, that they may have the wisdom and strength to complete the service to which you have been called. Let your blessing rest on this congregation, not only in its temporal affairs, but above all in its ministry. Strengthen and increase the faith, love, and zeal of each member, that your name may be glorified, and that in every place the kingdom of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grow. Amen. Thank you. You may return to your seats. And the congregation would rise. We will sing together our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
Let us confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of our Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 to 31. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our psalm is Psalm 147, the first 11 verses. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God and the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. And our epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 27. 
for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Our gospel lesson for today is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 29 to 39. And for the next few weeks here, for sure, we're going to be doing God's Word as our great heritage as we prepare for the gospel. From Mark chapter 1, verse 29 to 39, And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her. And she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he heard many who were sick with ver- he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and they said to him, everyone is looking for you. He said to them, Let us go to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends the reading of God's word. And let us sing together him, Beautiful Savior.
Heavenly Father, your word is truth, and we pray that in this time as we hear your word proclaimed, that that truth would fall on us in such a way that our hearts would receive it, it can grow, and we would be able to share it with our friends and our families and the people that we encounter all week long. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Continuing here in the Gospel of Mark, I did some looking ahead as we do Mark 1, 29 to 39, there's a little bit more of Mark chapter 1 that um, the lectionary doesn't bring us back to. It doesn't really bring us back to chapter 2. We see a small hint of chapter 3 and a small hint of chapter 5 and 6. It's like the lectionary just leaves Mark out a little bit um, as it tries to fit a bunch of John in. And, and we don't even start taking off in Mark again until we get to like June and July this year. So... I'm going to go against the grain, and I'm going to continue going through Mark uh, chapter and verse, um, and we'll see where that leads us, and maybe we'll end up uh, caught back up to where the lectionary picks up, or maybe we'll finish it early and have to do something different. But as Mark continues, again, this theme, immediately he left the synagogue, goes from one thing to the next. Mark has that sense of urgency, that reminder that this is... We on this side of the cross, as we read this, we know the end of the story, but Mark is trying to display for us this hurried up notion of getting to the cross. And also a reminder that there's a lot of hints at Jesus keeping this cross a secret as you read Mark, all the way up until about chapter 8. And then chapter 8 kind of changes where all of a sudden Jesus doesn't care who knows. He wants everybody to know. And, and so we are definitely in this building up and keeping it a secret stage. And we will see that here as, um, as the scene has changed. We're now at Simon's uh, mother-in-law who is ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her. Verse 31, he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her. This word lifted her up. In, in the Greek, there's different ways of saying lifted up, but one of them is the same word as what we would hear for the word in English, resurrected. Now, she was not dead, but she was brought back, lifted up from her fever, all in this one motion. And as we on this side of the cross know that Jesus dies for our sins, when we hear that he resurrects her from her fever, it's it's definitely innuendo that's pushing us to be thinking about the cross in the future as we know we're going to get there. Um, another interesting thing about this verse, the fever left her. That word left, the way it was, the fever was dismissed by Jesus is the same word in the Greek as, as to forgive, as to divorce. So different ways of understanding that as she is healed, the fever is, is forgiven her, separated from her, divorced from her, separated from her. And I was thinking about that. The concept of divorce is, is not a good one for us. We usually always have negative connotations around the word divorce. But in instances of the kind of separation that it is, it can be beautiful imagery. If we look to the scripture and we think how Jesus divorces our sin from us, completely separates it so that there is no contact between them, that's beautiful imagery. And so don't let the negative tone of the word divorce catch you in the midst of how Jesus touches her, lifts her up, resurrects her, and divorces her fever from her. He is, he is saving her from this instance. It's also good to understand, just to reiterate, the idea when Jesus forgives you for your sin, that that sin is being sent away from you. It is leaving you, as we have here in the, the fever left her, your sin leaves you, your sin is divorced from you, separated from you. It's not going to affect you. Verse 32, that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. What happens when Jesus heals one person? Well, everybody starts to hear about it, and they all start to come. A um, little bit simpler text, uh, simpler Greek here for, for those who were sick, quite literally translated, those who have bad. Those who have bad. 
sounds like maybe a, you know, a second grader trying to explain something more difficult, but the idea that somebody is sick, that they have bad, we, we can start to begin to understand, you know, there is good and there is bad out there. And when you have bad, you don't want it. You want to get rid of it. So, um, and then those who are possessed by demons or those demoniacs, um, those are the ones that are coming to Jesus for healing and to have the demons cast out. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Um, this word gathering is the same word in the Greek for, for synagogue, that, that idea of when you had ten men who were coming to study the word together. Uh, so this, this gathering is here. It's interesting at the end of this passage, it comes up that there's a gathering and kind of sandwiched in the middle of this. We understand that Jesus has his own gathering. He has his his inner circle that is kind of like Jesus' synagogue, if we think of his disciples and, and later on the apostles as that gathering. <clears throat> Another thought about how Jesus touches the hand to heal and, and lifts her up. Um, just a little bit of an illustration that I saw in one of the commentators. If I've been working on my car and I get my hands all greasy and I touch you, the dirt transfers from my hand and it gets on you and it gets you dirty, right? We understand that, especially in this era of COVID and trying to keep clean and using our hand sanitizer every time somebody touches us because we know that we've got germs that we can't see on us. When Jesus touches you, Jesus is not dirty, he is clean. And his cleanliness, his, his clean state transfers from him to you. You don't get him dirty because you can't, because he's without dirt, without sin. So just that interesting idea, when Jesus touches you, you receive his cleansing touch. Verse 35 Verse 34, I skipped 34. He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. There's that keep it a secret here from the Gospel of Mark. And rising very early in the morning, while, they were, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And I always, when I see Jesus do this, I'm reminded of the importance for me to do this. And I'm reminded of the importance to echo for you to do this. Um, people, people think, oh, I'm pretty good in my spiritual life, so I don't need to do devotions anymore. Jesus found time to get away, to quiet places, to pray, to, to focus how can we ever get to a point where we think that we are good enough to not need that? It is very important for us as God's people to do this devotional thing, to focus our hearts. Some people find straight reading the Word is the best way. Some people find singing or listening to hymns or Christian music is a great way. Uh, prayer is a great way. A combination of all those, journaling, there's all kinds of opportunities for each and every person to, to tailor something to themselves. As long as um, we know we're focusing our heart on God in that time, and um, by focusing our heart on God, I would hope that we could be using the Word of God to do that as, as our primary tool, um, but many other tools are out there. Verse 36, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. So Jesus goes off to his quiet place. They start to realize as they wake up, Jesus isn't here, let's go find him. How often when you uh, wake up and you have maybe a struggle going on in your life and you haven't really felt the presence of God or um, felt like he's been a big part of your life, is your reaction the same as Simon and those who are with him to go searching for Jesus? I hear so often when people feel like they've been separated for God from some reason, the last thing they want to do is to go search for him. But uh, practical advice here from Simon, go looking for him, go looking for him, uh, seek and you will find. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. I could just see Jesus. He, 
To put this in perspective, Jesus starts out here in his ministry in the Gospel of Mark, and he wants to preach. And he begins, I'll read it again, back in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the Gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the Gospel. This desire to tell everybody to repent and to believe it is time, uh, the, the world is going to change here. This, this message of Jesus, he's trying to get out. And then what do you do when one of your closest friends says, my mother-in-law is sick, can you come and heal her? Well, you go and heal her. And, and after you heal her, then the whole town ends up at your door and you're healing and casting out demons and and. How much preaching do you get to do in that? It, it, it just it seems like Jesus' initial, um, initial purpose here has been thwarted by, by miracles and all these fascinating things that we like to cling to and say, oh, look at the wonderful stuff Jesus is doing. But what's his main purpose and goal? He wants to preach. He wants to share this word of repent and believe in the gospel. And he said to them, Go and let us go into the next let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. So Jesus, you know, in the midst of everybody looking for him, why are they looking for him? They're looking for him for what seems to be the wrong reasons. Everybody is flocking in droves to find this Jesus who is performing miracles, who is healing, who is casting out demons. And Jesus says, We need to leave this town, which everybody's all excited about this stuff. We need to go somewhere else where I can preach. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So I could see some of this same pattern building up. He'd get to preach some, and then he'd do some miracles, and then the town goes into a flurry, and then you got to go to the next town. And this kind of becomes the pattern of Jesus in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. I'm here to preach. That's Jesus' Jesus's main point. And for us to hear it today, we hear these words like, uh, the, the fever left her. And we can look forward to the cross and recognize that as we've been forgiven, our sin has left us. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus, the clean one, who has touched us and removed our dirt by letting his cleanliness come from us, from him into us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word today, and we pray that as we hear how Jesus healed and cast out demons and preached, Lord, we pray that the word he preached would fall on our hearts in such a way we would always remember what it means to be your people, to live as repentant sinners who love you and love what you have done for us on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Let us rise and sing together, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sin, the words on the screen. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will be converted unto thee. Forgive us according to your goodness and grace, through the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our declaration of grace, so far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed his sins from you. God bless you this day. Amen. And let us sing our closing hymn, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.